One of the cars here at World Time Attack that straight away caught my attention for the attention to detail and the quality of the build is Matt Plowman's Lotus Elise behind me. So we wanted to take a moment to catch up with Matt and find out a little bit more about the build. Matt, for a start, the Lotus platform is maybe not the most popular here at World Time Attack. What made you decide to pour so much effort and energy into this particular build? Well, after talking with Andrew Brilliant, based on his knowledge, we chose it as a, uh, a good platform because of its weight. Uh, but as I said to you before, we can actually build this car in the current regulations to 688 kilos if we want. But uh, that was the main reason behind doing it. And Lotus's sort of drive right from the early days has always been to gain performance through lightweight as opposed to through massive amounts of engine power, correct? That is correct, 100%. I mean, Colin Chapman's philosophy to the two, well and truly. Okay, however, we get to a point and at World Time Attack, lightweight will only take you so far and then you also need power. So talk to us about what powered these engines off the showroom floor. Okay, so if you go back to the original, anywhere between 99 to 2004, they ran a Rover-based motor, A-series Rover motor, which was about 90 horsepower. Uh, from there, a long way away from where you need to be. <laughs> absolutely. About 2005, they went to a 2ZZ, which gave you about 220 horsepower. Um, and then obviously, since about 2011, they've gone to the 3GR, which is giving you the anywhere between 350 to 420 horsepower. However, in the Lotus world, it's become reasonably common, as I understand it, to perform a K-swap. Go with the Honda K20 engine? Absolutely. The most common swap you can do in a Lotus. What's the complexities involved with getting a K20 into the back of an Elise? The main issue, if you were to put it into a standard car, which is a lot of them do, it's only a couple of engine mounts and basically the drive shafts, the half shafts you need a little bit longer. Yeah, sound, sounds reasonably straightforward. I mean, uh, that's obviously glossing over a lot of the details, but uh, let's get a little further into yours. Uh, K20 is a great engine, uh, probably arguably one of the best naturally aspirated four-cylinder engines out there. Uh, but again, naturally aspirated wasn't going to cut it. So I've seen you've got a big turbo hanging off that. Uh, talk us through the build of the engine for a start. What's, what's involved? Uh, what are the internals? How sure. thorough have you gone with that? No, so we've started from scratch. So we, we split the block, decked the top of the block. Then we put in um, some Carrillo rods in it and some Wiseco pistons and had the head built by Phil O'Brien at Performance Wholesale, which is all titanium lifters and everything in it. We then stuck uh, in its current vise uh, a G35 1050 on it and hoped that would do the job for us. <laughs> it's a pretty sizable turbo. I should just come back one step. With the K-Series, there's a K20, and it's also very common to go with the K24 block and obviously gain 2.4 litres of capacity. Which way did you go there? So we stay with the K20, with the K20 head, just for the revving, because they make a lot of power up at their top rev range with the turbo, and the K24 just doesn't rev enough. Yeah, that was the main reason. All right, fair enough. We've talked about the turbo. So what sort of power aims were you going with when you designed this combination, and where did you actually end up? So we aim to make a thousand horsepower with this car and we're comfortably there if we need to be. What sort of boost does it take to, to make that? 28 pounds. Okay, it's not even really pushing it too hard that's correct. there. Yeah, that's correct. It's one thing making a lot of power but the rest of the package is just as important. So obviously looking at the car externally it is uh, pretty wild and a long way away from what Lotus first envisaged. So, you mentioned off camera that you started by stripping this thing down to a bare chassis. So uh, did, was this always the intention when you started the build or did things just sort of get uh, a little bit out of control? A silly conversation with Andrew Brilliant made it start from squat. So we started uh, straight away. Um, and it just evolved with the aero over the last couple of years because obviously when we first designed this car back in 2014, he hadn't had that aero options at that stage. So he's learned more through that time, and that's why the Infinity Wings are on it now. Okay, so Aero has become such a, a key element with World Time Attack, and every year we come here, we see more and more wings, wider body kits, and it's just sort of evolving year on year. You know, what, what were the limitations in terms of the rule book, and how close to the line were you sort of running with what Andrew designed? 
So in our current guys, we are nowhere near the limits. So we can go a lot wider um, and we can extend uh, probably lengthwise quite a bit as well. We're well and truly within the loop, yeah. What was the process of working with someone like Andrew Brilliant in terms of the design and then obviously the do design's one element, I'm yeah. not going to downplay how important that is Absolutely. and Andrew's obviously very well proven in terms of his capability but once you've got that design you've actually got to make the parts as well and I would sort of almost see that as a bigger hurdle so can you talk us through that process? So obviously once the designs come from Andrew he sends the cat across to our carbon manufacturer so then the carbon manufacturer's got to make moulds and that's not a cheap process to do in itself. And then once uh, the mould's done, we start flopping out some parts and then work out whether they're right or not. And, and then work out how you mount them. <laughs> you know? Once you actually got the car finished, so we're jumping ahead a little bit, but uh, once you actually got the car finished, what's the process then of actually validating the performance of that aero? And I mean, obviously you've got adjustability in the, the rear wing, yep. you've got the infinity wings on the front. What's the, what's the process of actually dialing that in and making sure it's working to its potential? So this car's probably got the, a catalogue of MoTeC sensors on it. So we run laser ride height sensors, we run shock pots, we run a pitot tube. That gives us enough data to let us know whether our aero is working. In terms of that aero, the, the people we talk to which, which have a lot of downforce on their cars, the problem is that at high speed obviously that downforce is essentially pushing the car into the track and you want to stop it bottoming out. Absolutely. But then the, the potential of running maybe a high spring rate in order to keep the car off the ground then affects its mechanical grip in the lower speed corners where we don't have that aero. How have you balanced that out? Okay, well if you don't think spring rate and high is very good, that runs 1450 on the front and 2000 pound rear on the rear. And uh, we run a couple of packers in the front to keep it off the ground. And that's as simple as it is. Okay, I'll come back to that. Those spring rates that you just mentioned on face value, people will be thinking this is huge. We do also have to remember it's the spring rate in itself is not that important. It's the motion ratio and the wheel rate that we actually need to consider. So depending on the motion ratio, the actual wheel rate can be probably a little bit more realistic. But again, with the aero, obviously you need uh, a high spring rate slash wheel rate. Uh, packers, you also mentioned that. Can you give us uh, a little bit more understanding of what that term means? So the packers that we've put in are just to stop the actual shock bottoming out on the bump stop. Um, so we run it just to give it a little bit higher so we're not banging the nose on the ground. But uh, it also helps the compliance of the bump rubber. So essentially a solid packer that goes on the shock above the bump rubber and you can just use that to tune essentially where the, the suspension will bottom out to keep the car off the ground. That's correct, yeah, absolutely. And it might, it might sound a little bit strange, conventionally the bump stop is there uh, as a sort of a safety backstop but with these high downforce cars we'll actually be running them purposely into the bump rubber and using that as a tuning tool. Correct, yeah. All right, let's talk about the rest of the car. Electronics package, you already mentioned Motec, so talk us through what so, else is in there. So it's, it's running a Motec M150. We run the dash as a C187. Uh, we've got an expander in there. We've got two PDM16s in it. And I think pretty much every other sensor that Motec offers under the sun. <laughs> so you ticked all of the option boxes in the Motec catalogue? Absolutely. Transmission. I know it's paddle shifted, so talk us through what you've got there. So it's got a Hollinger MF in it. Um, and. Um, we put, we put that in there just because it's reliability of its torque modelling. So it offers off 850 newton metres guaranteed in the gearbox and we knew that we would never be near that so we're safe. And obviously you don't want to come to an event like this and end up having a failure as a result of uh, a gearbox problem. Uh, in terms of the options with shifting a sequential dog box like that, obviously we've got the conventional lever uh, driver actuated. Uh, what was your sort of impetus behind going the paddle shift route? I suppose knowing the Motec dealer in Queensland made it easy to go that way. Um, we always wanted to go paddle shift. Um, I think that, that there's time to be made in paddle shift. So if we start with the package right correctly, and we always had the plan on putting a pro driver in the car at a later stage. I mean, I think the other thing that can't be overrated or overlooked is the fact that a properly set up paddle shifted package or combination is generally going to give a lot more reliability of the gearbox and the, the dogs inside of that gearbox as well. Absolutely. Suspension wise, everything I look at here looks like a, a sort of a factory built GT3 race car. So how far away are you from the stock Elise? Quite a ways. <laughs> 
So our A arms, we move the A arms out two inches each way, so we're four inches wider than a standard GD3 car. Uh, from there, we run Nitron three ways, which was built by a guy over there at Nitron in the UK, um, and then obviously valved to suit the aero loads that we were running. What, what about the upright? So it looks like you're, you've got a billet upright, which again I'm, I'm assuming is not production Lotus. No, it's not. And I'll, I'll give a good shout out to my main man, Dave Wilson, for doing that at Wilson Engineering. So we started out with a, a part that was available from Elise Parts that was a four stud upright. And we knew that we needed five stud to give us two, op two things, a bigger bearing and obviously a wheel option as well. And our wheel options are a lot greater as a five stud than a four stud. And uh, he made those for us, allowing us to put bigger caliper mounts on there as well. Okay. And I see you've also got a, a host of sensors there, including uh, infrared brake temp. So how are you utilising the data from that brake temp sensor? That tells me if I'm pushing the brakes hard enough or not. <laughs> so essentially about deciding whether you're in the operating window for that particular pad that you've chosen? That's correct, yeah. So we run a Cusco, uh, sorry, Cusco, a Circo pad in it, and uh, it's just got great initial bite, yeah. All right, in, in terms of the combination as it sits, uh, where you're at lap time wise and where do you think you can get it down to? Well, currently I'm sitting at a 132. A few more years in the seat might get us down into the mid 20s, but I think uh, I'm getting too old for that, so I might get someone that can do it naturally and put them in it. <laughs> uh, as long as you're having fun at the end of the day and you're smiling, so I'm guessing you are, that's the main thing. Absolutely. Look, Matt, really appreciate getting some insight into the car. Thanks for your time today and we wish you all the best for the rest of the weekend. Thanks, Andre. Cheers. If you like that video make sure you give it a thumbs up and if you're not already a subscriber make sure you're subscribed. We release a new video every week and if you like free stuff we've got a great deal for you. Click the link in the description to claim your free spot to our next live lesson.